And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, we're ready to get back into our Father's Word. The death of Stephen has just transpired. And there was a young man, Saul, his name, whereby those that stoned Stephen to death after giving one of the best Bible lessons, summaries of God's entire plan, basically, then they laid his, their coats at his feet, and I'm sure he was watching them. And he was in agreement with them stoning Stephen to death because this same Saul would later be named Paul, and he would write a great deal of the New Testament. God would use him. For that reason, I want you to pay particular attention to what Paul or Saul at this time, what his free will is. It's important that you know he didn't volunteer to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He had studied and was a student of the old way, that is to say the Old Testament, which uh, is the right way, but he had missed Messiah, that being one of the main things, be that as it may. He was an excellent Bible scholar, had studied under one of the the greatest scholars of the day. And he was very zealous. And when you recognize that in a person, they're going to have great zeal for whatever they do. The same as after Paul's conversion, he would have this great zeal and drive to win people's hearts and minds and souls into the way, which is to say the way of Christ. That same zeal you're going to see here in his free will is to persecute Christians. So I want to make up this point very strong whereby you note that some people are called, some people are chosen. It wasn't Paul's free will to serve uh, Messiah, Yeshua. We'll see how it formulates. Okay, let's learn a little about Paul and his mission. Chapter 8 of the great book of Acts, verse 1, and it reads, with that word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name. And Saul, being Paul, was consenting unto his death. Yeah, he was watching the coats, but he was all for it. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. The apostles stuck. I want to call attention to the word death in the um, first sentence of this verse. It's not the normal word used for death in the Greek. And you that have con strong concordances, I would advise that you check this word out. It's used very seldom. The prime in the Greek of it, not the word itself, but its prime, means um, to take away, to, um, to lift out, uh, to begin a journey. Interesting word. I just say that in passing for a different study for a different time. But it's, it's one of the few places this particular word is utilized as death and it, in as much as the way Stephen died with heaven opening, check out the word, then take it to its prime, and I think you'll be pleased with what, you, what it uh, looses to you. Okay? Verse 2. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. These were righteous men, pious, you could even say, that uh, that took care of his burial. Three, as for Saul, he made havoc. He laid waste of the church, entering into every house, even private homes, and hailing. Hailing is an old English word that means hauling, okay? Hailing men and women committed them uh, to prison. Now, the word hailing here, that where the Old English word is utilized in the Greek, is pseudo. 
And uh, suro means to actually drag or trail. I mean, he drug them, men, women. And it's important that you note, for those of you that think church was men only, forget it. Paul is very careful to bring the fact forward that women were very active in this as well. And the humiliation for a woman publicly is easier to bring to pass than for men, but that did not deter women from, from serving Yeshua. Okay? It wasn't a safe thing to do to be a Christian at this time. All right? But again, I want to reemphasize this did not detain women from practicing and so forth in the very word itself uh, preserving that truth. Verse 4. Therefore they, that's to say the believers, both men and women, that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. In other words, uh, preaching the word what? The word of Jesus Christ. And in this, I hope you can understand our Father's way enough that you're going to find in the ninth chapter that he had chosen Paul long ago. And I would not be surprised that our Father did not cause Saul to scatter the church for the very purpose of spreading the word. I mean, that's, that's the purpose. It wouldn't do any good if they were all in one little nest in Jerusalem. But through Paul's efforts, along with his associates, uh, by bringing fear on Christians, they scattered. And wherever they scattered, they took that seed with them, planting that seed and teaching and spreading that word. Yes, I think if you look below the surface, spiritually, you'll see God's hand even in that. Verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. This is the Philip that was a good friend of Stephen's. You'll remember back in chapter 6, he was chosen with him. Verse 6. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing. And understand that. Not just hearing, but also seeing the miracles which he did. It's real important, beloved. When, when I read a verse like this, uh, I, it worries me that you might think, yep, Philip was doing that. No, Philip wasn't. And God is offended when you don't realize and have the knowledge to know it was the gift given Philip that brought to pass the miracles. In other words, it's our Father doing it. And you better give him the credit for it. Because this in itself tails off to something. Now, that was some preacher. He did healing. No, he didn't. Where you get people that become self-anointed uh, healers or sideshow artists that uh, feel, um, well, if Philip did it, I can do it. Philip didn't do it. God did it through Philip. All right? Don't ever forget that. It's important. Well, that's a very humbling uh, way to look at it. It's better be the way you look at it because that's exactly how it is. And if you expect God to ever give you a gift, you'd better give him the credit for the gift, all right, and not take it for oneself. Seven, for unclean spirits crying with loud voices, the word in the Greek is screamed, came out of many that were possessed with them. And... Many taken with palsy. They, they were paralyzed. And that were lame were healed. It is, it is possible. Healings do take place. Uh, always bear in mind, though, that when Jesus himself went down to the pool, there were hundreds there. But he only healed one. It was to teach a lesson. And there is always a purpose for a miracle. I will say that and leave it at that point. Verse 8. And there was great joy in that city. It was true joy. It was the joy that Christ was present through the Holy Spirit, that these things were being accomplished. A person that bears the gift from God to accomplish a thing 
is a can-do type person that does bring forth joy. All right? Verse 9. And there was a certain man called Simon. Now, this certainly isn't Simon Peter. He's exactly 180 degrees the opposite direction from Simon Peter. This Simon is straight from the house of Satan, all right? Which before time in the same city used sorcery. That's, he was a magician, all right? And bewitched the people of Samaria giving out that himself was some great one, number one, a number one. He even claimed to be God, all right? He, he felt he was God. And it was strictly all um, a, and, um, uh, tricks through magic and so forth, uh, using trickery from his own actors that worked with him and so forth till he had quite a little church service that would go on there, all right? Verse 10, to whom they all gave heed. They listened. This was Samaria now. Watch Mountain. They gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And I don't want you to overlook that fact memorize, I mean, hold that in your mind, lock it there for a moment. To have the power of God would almost be Messiah himself, all right? Because he's claiming in that sense to be God. Never forget Luke, um, or Matthew rather, chapter 18, verse 10. I'm sorry, chapter 10, verse 18, where Christ gives us power over all our enemies. It's very important. Verse 11. And to him they had regard. I mean, they respected him. Because that of a long, of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But it was all fake. Real sideshows. Great revivals. Now, th this doesn't mean he had some sign out front, I'll read palms or something of that nature, if that, when, when he bewitched, if that's what com picture comes to your mind, it was religion. Tent shows, all right? Uh, and, and side circus shows and um, revival meetings and so forth, 12. But when they believed Philip uh, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, that's to say Yeshua Messiah, they were baptized, both men and women. And I want to reemphasize again, both men and women. They knew that Christ was Messiah. Why? Because of the proof of uh, the can-do ability of the Holy Spirit when someone that is paralyzed is touched and they're healed. We know that man alone cannot do that. There is something supernatural and divine taking place. This is what even brought Simon's attention to it. I mean, hey, this was good stuff. If he could do this in his circus, his revival, he would really have something. Verse 13. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized... He continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now, understand this. Don't let yourself be deceived. Simon believed that the miracles were real, but he was in no way converted. It was in that he believed they were real because he was seeing them that he wanted the ability to do this himself. And that's impossible because it wasn't Philip accomplishing them anyway. It was Almighty God. And that's why it's important that you always lock that in your mind and give praise to our Heavenly Father for his divine influence. He wanted to learn more about these miracles. So he went right along with them, even to the point of baptizing. If that's what it took to be able to do this, he said, I'm going to get myself dipped, and hey, I'll be able to do this also. Friend, if, you, if you're being baptized to acquire some 
special benefit for your own personal gain rather than for the overall many-membered body of Christ, forget it. You're playing games, and you're going to be deceived. Verse 14. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Now, this would be two of the chief apostles, 15, who, when they were come down, uh, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now, this word ghost, uh, naturally, you know, I usually say spirit. The word in the Greek is pneuma, which means air, wind, breath, spirit. It doesn't mean spook, all right? Why was it translated ghost? I have no idea. That's one of the reasons you should read the letter that the translators of the King James Version wrote in the original King James. That's why we carry the original King James, so that you can read that letter, not have it as a study Bible, because it's Old English, and many of you would have great difficulty even in reading it. But you can make out the letter that the translators warned you about. That's why you will usually always hear me read Holy Spirit, because it's Holy Numa. You know, you know what Numa is? You know what a pneumatic tire is? We use that word a lot in English. It means a tire that is pressurized by air. All right? It's pneumatic. All right? Okay. 16. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, the Holy Spirit had not, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, what this is talking about is the Holy Spirit that fell on them on Pentecost Day, where some of them, that uh, all of them that it fell upon, spoke with that cloven tongue, which means with the evidence of the whole presence of the Holy Spirit, that it didn't matter where you came from, it wasn't unknown. You heard it in the very dialect of where you were born. You will never find anything written that the tongue, that is to say from God's word, man's word you might, on Pentecost Day was unknown. You won't find the word unknown in the second chapter of Acts. You know that as we just finished covering it. That hadn't happened yet, okay? 17, then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. In other words, just like they had on Pentecost Day. Now, can you imagine old Simon when he observed this? Wow, that is the trick of tricks. Wow, if I can get that, I can put on a circus that will ne it just, it'll just wow everybody. Okay? Verse 18. And when Simon saw that through laying own of the, hand, the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Now, this is where he really messed up. And he really messed up because it was Peter that he offered the money. And you know, Peter was a man, an old fisherman, and he got right to the point, all right? He didn't beat around the bush. Verse 19, saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever, I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 20. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. I mean, he cut him down to size. 21. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. In other words, that, that's saying, you're a fake. For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Um, it all, you know, you don't fool a person, a man or a woman or a child of God. You can't con them. You might fool them for a little bit. You won't fool them for long. But these people that put on circuses called church services or revivals, and I'm not saying all revivals are this way. Some of them are genuine. They do good. But sometimes you have a charlatan that practices, yeah, there's even a word for it. It's called simony, all right, that mimic this one Simon, that do it for money, all right? Verse 22, Peter continues, 
Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart might be forgiven thee. Now, did you hear what Peter said to him? He said, you better pray. You better get right with God. You better start talking to him, all right? 23, for I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. You're, you're bound up by sin, in the chains of sin. Um, gall of bitterness is the gall of jealousy. He sees all this happen. I want this great gift for myself, for my own personal uh, profits. Verse 24. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. Did you get it? Do you see how disgenuous he was? What did Peter tell him to do? This is important, beloved. It's very important. It's important in your daily life. Peter said, you pray to God for forgiveness. And Simon, after hearing this, having this uh, dressing down from Peter fall upon him, said, you pray for me. All right? You see, that won't cut it. He did not do what Peter told him to do. He wanted Peter to do it for him. That shows a great lack of faith, of, of uh, sincerity. It shows a great lack of a lot of things. 25, and they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. You know, in history concerning old Simon, he goes on from this point, and this is not biblical. What I'm going to share with you is, is, his, is uh, history, or at least it is said of simony when simony is brought up. And remember I told you to mark in your mind, he said he's got the power of God, or the power of God is on him, and he was really somewhat. Well, he really believed that in his own heart. He had observed and witnessed these miracles to the point that he made up his mind that to really have the gifts and to document that you were God, that you had to be buried for three days and then resurrect. So do you, do you know what the boy had done? He had himself entombed, and he said, in three days I'm out of here and we're going to take over the world. And guess what? It still hasn't happened. He's still in there. He's still down there. He's still buried. When he was there three days, he was deader than a hammer, all right? Which anyone knows that's what would happen. But he really believed in himself rather than God. The reason I share that with you, I want you to think about it. I said he really believed in himself rather than God. And no doubt he was good at trickery. He was probably really one of the best when it came to, to illusion or making something seem uh, uh, that it was what it wasn't in deception. That's Satan's game. So, again, that's why you must always give credit to God, our Father, and understand that 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 is divine comes from Him. And quite frankly, beloved, sometimes you have to shut your earthly eyes and open your spiritual eyes to really see that presence and the blessings of God when it pertains to gifts. Simony. I, I, I kind of, I, I, it's always been a humorous thing to me. I, I think it's funny. I'll just put it that way. To see this clown with all the people decide, get so, uh, deceiving so many people that he finally builds himself up to the point that he's going to do it exactly the way that other man named Jesus did because they're all following him. All I got to do is 
go in that grave and come out in three days and hey, I've got just as good a show as he does. Well, think about it. Verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake to Philip. This is the angel of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, the angel of God, God's presence. Spake unto Philip saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Uh, uh, Gaza, Gaza as we pronounce it in this day. It means fortified. It's in the news of late even, 27. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia and eunuch of great authority under uh, Candace, uh, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to uh, Jerusalem for to worship. Um, Candace, and Candace means to the prince of uh, servants, all right? The, the queen's name. Now, I have no doubt that with God sending him here, you see a further opening of uh, God's word to all people. That means Gentile to Israelite. And in the next chapter, I'll document that further. Verse 28. Uh, and, and this eunuch, a eunuch was always placed in the king's court as usually was a strong person but was unable to bother the queen or any of her, the king's harem and so forth. 28, he was uh, returning and sitting in his chariot read Isaiah, which is to say Isaiah, the prophet. Now, um, it's pretty common for us to think about Bibles today. Yes, I had my Bible right with me. Well, there weren't Bibles at this time. There were scrolls. And for you to have one, usually they would only be found in synagogues or um, uh, someone that was, was very wealthy. All right. In this case, I suppose that he was getting this for the queen. Uh, and he's reading it. And is as the custom uh, many people of this area read out loud. He was, 29. Then the Spirit, um, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to his chariot. Verse 30. And Philip ran thither uh, to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah and said, Understandeth thou what thou readest? Do you understand that? Verse 31. And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? I need a teacher. Some man should instruct me. And he desired, or he begged to Philip, that he would come up and sit with him. 232. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his share, so opened he not his mouth. You'll all recognize that as the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. You've heard me preach many a communion service from it. 33. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? Question. For his life is taken from the earth. Verse 34. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Question. Who was he talking about? Of himself or of some other man? In other words, he did not know that Christ had walked the earth, had died on the cross, and now was risen. And... Um, and Philip continues to teach. Verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Well, now that's rather difficult. What would we have to do? We would have to go to, he was reading verse 7 and 8 of Isaiah 53. 
uh, Philip opens uh, still to Isaiah uh, 53 and picks up reading where the eunuch had left off. So we turn to Isaiah 53, and naturally, what would be your starting verse? Nine, of course. Uh, for we pick it up there in verse nine reads, this is what he continued teaching the eunuch. And he made his grave with the wicked. In other words, he was crucified between two malefactors. And with the rich in his death, he was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, uh, Mary, his mother's uncle, in which even to this day is called um, Joseph the Tin Man in Glastonbury, England, where his great ships would go, and he had tin mines there, even taking a young lad in his younger age with him at times. He was buried in his new tomb. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. And he would continue, 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure or the purpose of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. 11. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. That's sufficient. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquity. He's going to bear their sins. 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, that crucifixion. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. In other words, he taught the eunuch, this was he. This was he. This is who he was talking about. In other words, he was answering his question. And he introduced him to Christ. Verse 36, as we continue in uh, the eighth chapter of Acts. And as they went on their way there, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, uh, here is water. What doth hinder, hinder me to be baptized? Question. 37, and Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, that's to say your mind, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Those few scriptures with Philip giving witness convinced him. 38, and he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. 39, and when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. I find the reason that one word named de called, uh, called death, translated death, uh, makes this an interesting thought. Our father is able, verse 40, to complete the chapter. And Philip was found at Azotus. That's Ashdod, okay? And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. And some people today pronounce it Caesarea, okay? Properly, Caesarea. Now, there's an interesting thing about this, and I, and I want you to overlook it. This particular area, this would take in Lydia, Joppa, uh, and a few other places. It was assigned to the tribe of Judah, and you'll find that written in Joshua chapter 15, 47. Um, but it was never subdued by the Israelites. And I think the main point God wants you to receive from that is that this one Philip, though the armies of Israel could not take this for Judah, which would Christ would be the seed of, 
that he teaching Christ was able to walk through it and take it by conversion when an army fail, failed to do, accomplish that. So I see in that the spread of the good news over all the world uh, and many times uh, bloodless. Sometimes there's even been a little bloodshed. But uh, we see Philip with the hand of God upon him for certainly he was gifted. And I have no doubts whatsoever that his old buddy Stephen was um, with him in spirit every step of the way, urging him on. So, what an experience. What a lesson. Paul's ministry basically will begin in the next chapter. It's important that you bear in mind again what Paul's free will was. It was to destroy the church. To destroy the followers of uh, Yeshua. Uh, he really felt he was doing right. It would be for this reason that Paul many times in his writing would say, sinners of who I am the greatest. Because he blamed himself as being a great sinner because of his persecution of the church uh, in, in a church that he loved so much and the rest of his life on earth he would spend uh, working in that church and even to this day his efforts are studied by many. All right, don't miss the next lecture. Paul's beginning in serving Yeshua. All right.